Hello, guys. Um, so in another minute, let's see if George comes in or maybe some other people. Okay, maybe we can kick off the meeting. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So, uh, let's. Uh, so this is the uh, Aries VCX community call, fifteenth uh, of June, two thousand twenty-three. Uh, Patrick is away, so I'll uh, try and do my best to fill in his shoes. Um, we have our antitrust policy notice here. Let's let that in on screen for a minute. Okay, and... Now I have been away myself for, for a while last week, so I might not be completely up to date with everything, um, but let's try and uh, kick off the meeting. So probably the um, hottest news, so to say, would be the kickoff of the mentorship program. Um, we have our two mentees for the uh, the mobile wrapper and the uh, Aries VCX mediator. Um, and those would be Swap Neil and Nyan, respectively. Um, the, the program just started, so um, they're, they're still getting up to, up to speed um, and in, just introduced into the project, as far as I know. Um, yeah, and I guess that's, that's some exciting news. So after the long selection we've chosen people they started out they accepted the the, the, the mentorships and uh we're we're starting to um to actually move this in in some direction so that's uh that's pretty much it for for the mentorship uh, really glad to have these people uh, on board um, and we can have a look at the recent work done. Um, so there are a couple of PRs uh, that have been recently merged. Uh, the first one, which um, extends the, the profile trait a bit um, by, by Patrick. Um, I know Mira, so I was away when this was done and I'm not up to date with all the details, but if you have some, maybe you know more about why this method was, was required. If you would like to provide some more information. Well, I'm, not, I'm not too sure myself. I mean, I originally uh, tried to uh, get rid of uh, the reliance on the global state uh, from which was 
to store the transaction auto agreement to store and mm -hmm. set it. And so I removed it in such a way that it is basically set once on initialization of the uh, ledger uh, uh, ledger struct. But Patrick uh, didn't like this pattern and uh, thought that we should uh, add a setter to make it possible to set the transaction author agreement at runtime without creating the ledger trade implementation uh, again from the scratch, which I mean, it's it's reasonable. Um, Fair enough. OK, I see. OK, cool, cool. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so that's been merged. Um, down the line, I guess our plan is still the same to kind of get rid of this profile thing. And um, there is also some, some other work that is going to facilitate this, um, again, done by, by Patrick. Um, basically, not passing around the profile through all these places and tests and wherever it was being used, but rather try to use the, the minimal um, or the, the more specific components of it that are actually required. So this is definitely going to facilitate getting rid of the profile as a construct and just passing around wallets or unknown creds implementations or ledger uh, trade implementers wherever we need them. Um, so this was also, um, it's it's quite a big PR, and this was March this week, um, but the it's fairly simple overall. So it was just, I guess, a lot of tedious work, but Patrick pulled through and essentially replaced the, the profile getting passed around with just specific parts of it that are needed. So that, is Patrick said that he found it relaxing. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Cool. It's even better. Okay. Um, now, this is also something I'm not entirely familiar with. I think this was something by George, uh, some sort of fix. Um, something done to basically be in sync with the AK. Akapai capabilities. Um, I see there is an issue here. So let's see. The request you send appears to have an empty string as the public keys controller and the doc. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so I guess this has to do with um, with the did doc construction, and this is still using the legacy did doc, and will be using the legacy did doc. Um, so I guess this was basically a bug that just um, slipped me in particular because I refactored this, um, and George was nice enough to fix it. And essentially looks like it's just about setting the ID first. Apparently that's being used in some other places. Um, fair enough. Well, some side effect probably in, in all of yeah. these. Um, mm. It's a matter of bad implementation of the old uh, Aries did doc. Uh, like the order shouldn't matter, probably. Yeah, it definitely shouldn't matter, but yeah, oh well. but it does. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but it, anyway, good good catch from George. So he fixed that. It's really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's really really great. And something from you, Mira, the uh, DDO facade for sovereign specific stuff. Uh, now this is not yet merged. I believe, but I personally approved it. So we had just that short discussion about the whatever the dummy or the empty set of fields for the service for the uh, Aries interoperability profile. Um, but apart from that, I approved it. It's all good. Um, 
I think it still needs a rebase, but from me, from my side, I, I guess we can merge it. Um, do you wanna do you wanna talk a bit more about about this and what it does and what you were targeting with it? Yeah, it's just um, like when I was integrating the new the doc into the rest of the code base, I noticed uh, that some uh, usage patterns are quite frequent. Uh, so with this wrapper, I just wanted to make it e a little bit easier to uh, use the, the doc rate for uh, our um, for specifically for the dates of uh, dates of the docs, which uh -huh. uh, like have uh, various um, let's say service types uh, with the various extra fields, and uh, yeah, we are using we are like uh, have. Uh, free do, doing some some kind of usage patterns frequently like retrieving retrieving the first routing key from a uh, service and so on so yeah i just wanted with, with this wrapper i wanted to make it be easier to use it um yeah so, okay so. i i do have a <clears throat> question that just popped into my mind right now so um, maybe it would be worth discussing, like for the entire community, the fact that we will have to maybe not necessarily maintain, but keep using the legacy the doc, um, because switching to, to the new one will be very, very tricky in the places where the, the old one is used. And that's particularly because of the unqualified bids. Now, um, I believe like the legacy did doc is basically for the uh, areas interoperability profile, right? Like that's what it technically represented. Uh, well, the legacy did doc technically represented uh, like unfinished version of the did doc or did so spec, uh, which changed since then, but still mm -hmm. like many frameworks use it so for example the public key field in the legacy did doc does not exist in the new did doc and there are like multiple, multiple some fields are uh, not required in the legacy did doc whereas they are required in the new one and a few minor incompatibilities like this between between the like W3C compliant the doc and the legacy the doc that we are using in connection right now and in uh, invitations and so on. So okay. uh, like most of the frameworks still support this old um, old uh, the doc format uh, in connection, and so that's uh, that's why we are still using it. And uh, like as it relates to qualified unqualified dates that's another thing that we are using unqualified dates in the in the did docs everywhere right now <clears throat> uh, but yeah qualified qualified did docs that's a, another big like can of worms but as it relates to the docs um no this is this is the reason and i guess there might be a way to somehow make uh or make the new did docs like um backwards compatible to uh, add this public key field, for example, or handle it, and or make make the fields like not uh, the the fields which are which should be required, make them not required for this backwards compatibility use case. Uh, well, but the question is whether it is worth it. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Hmm. Um, and I mean, you you were the one that worked on this for quite some time and from what I gathered from your research you essentially said that uh, this is what pretty much all the other implementations have done so they they're still uh, carrying around the, the legacy implementation because like maintaining backwards compatibility in the new one would be too much of a hassle so mm -hmm. I guess the, the dream is to at some point drop the old one sometime um, and then just keep using the new one with the new new format, but with the differences between them and especially differences in terms of required fields and stuff like that, that would just make it very, very weird. Um, 
to mm. use a, a singular uniform implementation. But one okay. thing that I like yeah. have not tested is whether um, whether if we uh, like send, for example, connection request with the new format in the new format, whether AFJ or Akapai accepts accepts uh, this new format, because it's quite possible that it that it does, and um, mm. I have not tested that, and. Yeah, if it did, then perhaps just switching to the to the new format and we might and we might remain like still fully interoperable. Um, so we might we might try that. Except except with older versions of Aries VCX. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's maybe too much to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, what about this this um like, is this being used somewhere? The the Aries interoperability profile kind of did doc. Mm. So this this relate this depends on the or is it not be used? On, on how on on like on how the service is written on the ledger. If mm. the service written on the ledger contains certain type uh like written like specified in it uh it should resolve to uh this aip1 uh the doc okay or, I see. Like, yeah. I see. so i think okay. that that one like should just contain like no keys just the service and point i think mm -hmm. okay i got it i got it uh, I, for for a split second there, I was wondering whether this and the legacy did doc might be on some sort of similar page, but they're not. Hmm. Um, okay, cool, cool. All right, um, yeah. So that's mainly the the recently done work. Um, like like we said, the DDO facade is gonna get merged in fairly soon. Um, and for the work in progress. Uh, something from my side would be the, the credential migrator, or rather the Anon cred specific stuff migrator. Um, this is still in progress, or rather the implementation seems to be done, um, but I'm not really willing to say that it's entirely done until all the testing is, uh, is in place. Um, now, testing this will be interesting. Um, right now, my plan for, for at least the first round of tests is to kind of create some dummy items and try to migrate those to Credex um, and then ensure that the types get deserialized correctly to the newer uh, or the data gets deserialized correctly to the Credex types. Now. To be fairly honest, the entire migration right now, again, before too much testing, um, was pretty straightforward, much more straightforward than I anticipated. Um, and I, I kind of feel I'm, I'm quite skeptical because it feels like it was a bit too easy, especially because this was supposed to be the trickier part, I guess. Um, I, I wish George was here because he had some um, some more insight. He worked a bit more closely with um, with Credex, and he did say that he noticed some quite fundamental differences between the VDR tools implementations of on implementation of Anon Creds and the Credex one. However, I, I, I haven't really. Uh, they they seem like they're pretty much exactly the same types, and the migration mostly just revolves around changing the category type of the credentials. Um, and then the plan is to get this from Credex to one on creds RS. And that's even gonna be more straightforward because those are, uh, I, I, now again, I didn't really look at that, but from our analysis from some time ago, we noticed that these are really, really similar. So uh, again, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, what do you think about like the other rounds of testing? So the 
like I, I really want to do the kind of dummy items kind of thing. Like I'm not even necessarily interested in functionally whether they are correct. I don't like a credential definition. I just want to fill it with dummy data and see that structure wise, the old, like if you create a, a, a live EDR tools credential definition, store it in the wallet, migrate it, and then try to pull it out into a credex credential definition. If that works um, from a deserialization standpoint, I guess that should be a, a good start. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering about testing this in a more real life kind of scenario. Because um, generally all the tests that we have are kind of self-contained, right? So I don't know you wanna, issue some credential um, so you might be generating uh, a schema a revocation registry a credential definition you issue the credential and then i believe stuff gets cleaned up doesn't it or or even if it doesn't get cleaned up when you when you want to run some other test um it's basically gonna it, it's self-contained so it's gonna use its own like whatever it types and, and definitions it creates within the test. So you cannot really reuse, even if you migrate the old ones, um, it seems kind of tricky to reuse the, the migrated items. So I'm really wondering how to go about that. What do you think? Uh, so I didn't catch like, what, why would it be, uh cumbersome to reuse uh, the like uh, items created before uh, the the migration so i mean you you can migrate existing items but as far as i know like the tests are pretty self-contained right yeah um, I, so you can't like do the migration in the middle of the test no i mean you can uh -huh. but i guess that would be the only option uh, to kind of have a test run midway, migrate, maybe change that profile um, to use the credx on on creds, and then let it continue from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that would be that would be one way to go about it. Um, Make enough. sure that the cre created credential definitions are still usable, that you can still right. like creating revocation registries and so on. Fair enough. Yeah, so okay. Some, issue some revocable credentials, uh, try to revoke them, verify, verify that, verify them and so on. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so I guess we need to sort of, um, Kind of identify these. Um, I know. Let's let's call them breakpoints in the in in the tests of interest and do the migration there and then change the profile and let it run as usual. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess I guess that's the really the only way to go about it, at least from a testing like self-contained testing kind of uh, kind of way. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so that's about the, the migration. We'll see how that goes. Right now, it doesn't seem to be um, too much of a, of a hassle. Hopefully, it's going to stay that way. Um, I know that it did appear something you wanted to, uh, to work on. Um, and you elaborated a bit yesterday. I believe that it's quite a, an extensive method. Um, I know any anything to add, Mira? Yeah. yeah, so uh, I was thinking a little bit after like uh, the attempted integration that we are not using uh, qualified it's uh, either as an issue or in in the connections. Uh, so <clears throat> we are basically using unqualified dates across the code base, and we are not typing our dates uh, basically at all. And um, so I created an issue for this, and uh, um, Stephen Stephen Curran picked it up and uh, pointed me to um, 
discussions which are going uh, going on right now in the Akapai community, where they were using unqualified. It's, uh, I mean, let's back up a little bit. Uh, there are like multiple parts to this. So we are, you, you can qualify debts when uh, you are talking about uh, issuer debts. Uh, so that's uh, like when, when uh, in Eris VCX term, you create uh, issuer configuration, you can either create uh, qualified or unqualified debt there. And so trying to create, um, we are right now creating always unqualified debts. Trying to create qualified it there changes behavior of the VDR tools and CredX a little bit so that the credential primitive IDs which they generate are uh, have a little bit different, the little bit different format. And this, of course, it's not that big of a deal if you of like I are creating a new issuer and starting it from scratch and, issu and issuing like um, credentials for the first time. But if you have an application which is built on top of Eris VCX and is, uh, has been using a uh, an issuer wallet for uh, some times, this might create some headache for you, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be difficult to, uh, might be, um, difficult but possible to somehow migrate your wallet locally but still there are these ids uh, which are on the ledger which are already written so it would require some uh, kind of uh, reissuing credential definitions and that's not no go so we would probably keep uh, for this reason keep using unqualified dates for uh, the issuer and that's not that big of a deal because we or oh no, well that's what we will we will do for, for the sake of like uh, saving saving us some headache and then uh there is the matter of uh dates which are sent in for example uh connection invitations or connection requests and uh there we are also using unqualified dates and that's what uh, Stephen like was talking about when he was pointing me to the did peer uh, specification and discussions in Akapai. And uh, Akapai basically uh, decided to, uh, to transition directly to did peer uh, numal go to, which is a specific kind of did peer. And uh, also, did peer three, which is a little bit um, uh, newer uh, in terms of when it was added to the specification, but uh, that's what they are planning to prefer and default to uh, going forward. Default to in the did exchange protocol, and they were also talking about remaining backwards compatible. Although mm -hmm. uh, I have been on the community or seen the community call recording. And there are voices in the community which are saying, which are kind of speaking against this backwards compatibility. Akapai has been always like trying to remain uh, conscious of the rest of the community, trying to remain backwards compatible as much as possible. But it seems that they uh, lately decided to change the stance a little bit and just give uh, like a notice period where they will, for which they will re remain backwards compatible. And from then on, they will they will only accept did peers. Uh, so from that's what I gathered from the community call. Uh, so uh -huh. this means for us definitely that if we are going to implement any protocol, it should use did peer two and three. Uh, AFJ supports it already. They are a little bit of a pioneer in this regard. Um, they support all uh, did peers, I think all, all did, did peers, except for did peer three, which is very new. Uh, so they support uh, the zero is basically the old uh, did key. One is uh, basically not fully specified in the spec and it involves hashing of the did doc, which is not like, 
let's say, which needs to be uh, somehow uh, yeah, specified for the, like the order of the fields and so on, because you have to, the, the, the hash, of course, must. Yeah, otherwise it's gonna, it's not gonna yeah. match. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. So uh, they basically say, oh, this is not, this is not specified in the spec. So let's not, let's not focus on that. And they focus right. uh, already on the DPF2, which, uh, which is like much better, um, specified much, much uh, better. So um, that's what I decided that I will work on uh, next, because there seems to be this community wide push for um, for using qualified dates. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite important to keep up uh, with the rest of the community. Fair and that's enough. probably regardless of whether we uh, go the did exchange, uh, or whether we will use it in the did exchange protocol or not, we should probably use it eventually in the connection as well. Okay. All right, cool. Okay, so thanks for for the the info on that. Uh, very very strong insight. Um, and maybe for our last point for the in progress work, uh, there is uh, again something from from Patrick, um, essentially related to refactoring some tests. This seems again like. Uh, quite a big PR, but I guess it, there's really no two ways ab around it since um, like the, the testing in place would pretty much affect every everything. Um, I see that this kind of continues uh, with the like not passing the profile and restricting to smaller smaller pieces um and i believe that from the description um you mentioned something about kind of getting rid of some of the setup objects um and apparently something about creating a faber agent for testing similar to um, to what we have for create Alice. Yeah. Um, well, Patrick has been out the entire week. So again, I'm not, maybe, you know, more, Mira. I don't know, but, uh, uh unfortunately not, not any, not anything. Well, I guess he'll be able to fill in on this next week. Um, uh, the latest. So. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of work that we have to do on testing and especially with the upcoming efforts on like even just on on creds, the state machines. Um, and yeah, like all these things start to intertwine, which ultimately, I guess it's not necessarily about them being intertwined, but rather we, we started working on some lower level blocks and because they are lower level, they kind of affect everything on top of them, right? So um, that's why things get a bit bigger now, but in the end, I, I believe it's gonna be worth it. Um, you already mentioned for upcoming plans, um, the, the did exchange protocol, um, I don't know if we, we necessarily want to talk about, about this now. Maybe we can, we can chat a bit uh, about our already kind of carried discussion um, about state machines. I, I wish George was here to kind of, I, I was really curious of his comments. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really wondering, um, I mean, right now, especially after talking with you, I kind of like you, I'm, I'm more, um, I don't know, settled, I guess, uh, more content with the decision we made uh, because it, it doesn't feel anymore like, um, um, I don't know, seeing that you're um, kind of content with the type state pattern 
also made me more, um, I guess it, it kind of, it was some sort of validation. Um, but I have been wondering whether the type state pattern for all these state machines has really been the, the way to go. And I guess the main drive point for the second guessing has been, um, I mean, on one hand, the lack of work that we've done on state machines, but it's not like any of us has been, like we've all been busy with all, all kinds of things. Um, and on the other hand, the work that has been put in the state machines and particularly, I guess it's only been George with the holder, uh, he seemed to hit some, like a series of hiccups um, with that. And I couldn't help but really wonder whether maybe, maybe it's simply, I don't know, maybe it's not the best way to go about it. Maybe some modern approach would have made it easier. Um, and right now I'm really just reiterating what we already discussed, but so I, like the, the type state pattern kind of makes it um, safer and more straightforward in terms of how these transitions go. And I guess ultimately what you want from, from a state machine in our context here in the, in the Aries context uh, is that you generally, um, like you get, you get some, some, some input, some message, something, and you want to pass that to a state machine. Now, generally, since you provide endpoints that you communicate with other parties, you have identifiers in place. So you know exactly what state machines you have allocated for a specific, um, a specific other party, right? So when you get a message, I know you get a, a presentation request or something like that, you kind of know the exact instance of a state machine that you will want to pass that to. Now, um, the, the general outcomes are that if the state machine is in the right state, then it's, you're going to continue and try to process the message. And if there's no error, then you're going to get, you're going to transition to a new state. But if it's not in the right state, then that you basically consider the, the message or the input as invalid as you were unexpected or have, however you want to call it. Um, so, Ultimately, like with the transitions being so far in between and at least conceptually, and then um, like this, this kind of separation of you get, you get some input. If it's right, you transition or you try to transition. If it's not, then tough luck. I guess that, that doesn't make it like, I don't know. I guess that the type state pattern really, I know, fits because of that. Um, but then it, it boils down to having different types for these states or these, yeah, the, the states of the state machine, um, kind of makes the need for, for these wrappers, like we have for the connection and the generic connection wrapper, which is an enum that encapsulates all the possible states. Um, and it that that's what kind of makes it feel a bit redundant like if you ever have to work with a state machine without knowing its state you cannot really just do that with um with the the different types that a state machine can have because you don't really know the type and where you don't necessarily care about the type so that's why this wrapper is there to basically try it it can deserialize for many of these states and it has some common stuff that you can call on it. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering now whether these common operations are, are a common practice. Like I know we have some stuff in libvcx. You also pointed out we have some stuff in the, the Rust agent implementation, which pretty much just runs in memory. Um, and the gen like the generic connection enum was pretty much mm, where it, essentially I made it to kind of fit these purposes that we had then. Um, and it's probably gonna still stay around to again, 
fill in these gaps. Um, but I'm wondering whether do we want to like from from a user if you are if you're a consumer of Aries VCX, do you want to use um, some sort of one size fits all state machine like the the generic wrapper and just cold stuff on it and handle it or do you want to have these individual types you know exactly what type you should be in based on the input you receive if you're not in you don't get the right type because deserialization fails then um then again tough luck in valid input or unexpected input or something like that because essentially like the benefit of the state of the the, the type state pattern is you're not going to get into an invalid state you if the state machine is not in the expected state it's because it never got to be there i guess um and maybe another point to consider um like we do in live vcx we have some um some object caching so or even in the in the rust agent because it all runs in memory because generally you want to have some sort of persistent storage because uh message sending in aries is not necessarily time constrained at least not generally so you can receive a message today transition receive another message tomorrow um and in a, in a proof presentation so it might they might span across longer periods of time so you want to have some sort of persistent storage generally and store data there retrieve the state machine try to transition put it back stuff like that but there's also the question of caching um, especially in memory and um, generally that helps with not having to look up your persistent storage every single time especially if operations happen quickly which by all means they generally do and probably will um but having a cache like that generally means that you might have to um to have a, a wrapper like a one size fits all kind of wrapper for the state machines or have some sort of smarter cache that stores all these individual types and separately and then is able to look them up um, somehow which also can be done but i'm, I'm just brainstorming right now i'm I, i'm wondering um what you think about all this and i'm really wondering what the others think about all this but yeah. there's just us now so yeah so like as i said i uh, don't have much experience with uh, interacting or using the new type state connection but uh, for what it's worth uh, i mean the usage pattern that you talked about um, where like you get get some input and based on the input you basically usually know or what state mm -hmm. you should expect it for that makes a quite good argument for the type state pattern, I think, mm -hmm. and I think that you actually said it yourself. So, um, so that's 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 an argument for. And then uh, you were talking about the uh, uh, generic connection rep, uh, enum mm -hmm. um, that uh, you are basically saying that it is redundant, but I don't uh, like. We do use it, applies this, we use it in libvcx, we use it in the uh, Rust agent. And like uh, you said it yourself, that there are, there are some situations where you don't know what the, the types uh, you should expect. For these situations, it's maybe useful to have to give the users the option to use uh, something like the generic connection. So I don't like see an issue with having it in, in Aris VCX. Uh, necessarily uh, it's just that it, it kind of combines you know two approaches um because if you have like um a state machine kind of built around enums then you basically have all the possible methods in that particular enum right and then based mm. on the in a variant you do stuff and you check things at runtime and 
you transition or you don't and, and so on. Um, so that's kind of a one size fits all. But like, like we've been saying um, with the way these state machines work and the way the protocols are actually designed, you kind of know when you get a message what where you, you should be and you can kind of determine the state you should be in and you can basically validate uh, whether you're in that state or not. So I'm, I'm basically a bit, I don't know, again, I'm, I'm really just wondering um, the, whether, the, whether there are a lot of cases where we need or whether there are a lot of cases where we want to work with a state machine without knowing its state, like we have in, um, I believe there is some some stuff in uh, in LiveVCX where I don't know you might you might want to try to get a did doc from the other party, but that obviously depends on where exactly you are in the connection mm. protocol. So you might get a dead dog or you might not. Now, you cannot really, because you can get a dead dog, I don't know, maybe you can, you have it in four of the five states as an invite, invitee, um, but you don't have it in one state. Um, you cannot really know. Like even if you had it in all five states, you still don't know what state you're in. So you cannot really just get it out. So, and maybe this is a broader question. Like I'm, I'm most familiar with the connection protocol because that's what I worked on. But um, thinking on other protocols like credential issuance or even proof presentation, um, do you generally want to do um, like state? state agnostic operations and if you do want to do them are there a lot of them well, because there are, are there are no state agnostic operations right I mean, uh, or or what, what would be an example like so i i don't know like for connection like i said uh, maybe a state agnostic operation would be to I don't know, uh, pull out the uh, counterparties did dog, if there is one. Well, there, so, there might not be one. So if there is no one, uh, then like yeah. just, just the fact that it depends on what state you are in kind of means that it is. Uh, yeah, but for instance, not... if you're in the completed state or in the responded state, you will have a did dog. But if you want to get it out of, of, a, of the of the um, of the state machine, you don't know if you pull pull the state machine from the database. You don't know what type to deserialize to, yes. do you? You either deserialize to respond it or to complete it, just to provide that did doc, right? So that's yes. kind of the the purpose that the generic in the generic connection enum serves. Yes. Um, but it seems like a limited set of things that we use that for and i guess that's technically fine oh. if, if it stays like that um but yeah i don't know maybe i mean i know we kind of the two of us kind of exhausted this a bit uh, and there probably aren't new ideas uh but i'm basically just i wanted to mention this on the call on the recording maybe patrick or george will listen in or maybe some other people and just kind of be uh, I don't know, for just mention it for posterity but maybe it would be worth mm. discussing this some more with with the other guys yeah definitely okay um all right so we we talked a bit about this you did talk uh, about uh, the qualified dids as well um now, I believe the decision about qualified bids, maybe not decision, but the idea in the connection protocol is to kind of not use qualified bids, keep using unqualified bids, keep using the legacy did doc, right? Mm, yeah. And use qualified bids from now on. Um, 
there is the uh, CLI demo, demo from George that's in progress. Um, and it's basically, I believe, similar to um, existing examples. I'm, I'm a bit familiar with the Akapai one. The know there's one in AFJ. Um, but I guess it's pretty much just for kind of showcasing the, the roles of agents and Aries through a CLI uh, app in Rust. It's pretty cool. Um, I mean, this actually, this is just an issue. <laughs> it's not a PR. Yeah. yeah. So, but I guess it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. Um, I know if George wants to pick this up, he seems to have put a lot of details into <clears throat> into the, the issue. So um, it, it doesn't sound far fetched that he might uh, he might start working on this. But um, and there's also the test harness update, which I guess it's kind of overdue. Um, yeah, I um, think is there... George mentioned mentioned on the last community call that he would like to uh, start working on, on the update a little bit. So I mm. don't know if he did start it or whether he did some investigation at least, or it's a, it's okay. a pity we don't have him for, for an update. Okay, cool. Um, and for the upcoming priorities, um, essentially what we've been discussing so far, so kind of splitting the uh, the ledger, not the ledger primitives, but the, the Aries primitives, um, having separate parts for ledger on and creds and wallet. Now, the on and creds part depends on the migration and then the on and creds RS implementation. I know you've done a lot of work on the, on the ledger part, um, also splitting the trait into multiple ones. I don't know exactly if we have any plans for some sort of volume migration for Oscar, but um, like it's pointed out here, it does kind of rely on the on on creds RS um, thing to be done. Because I guess it, it kind of defeats the purpose otherwise. Well, maybe they're not that related. I guess you could technically use any wallet, but. Um, Ultimately, if we want to migrate to the newer stuff, we should do it iteratively, I guess. Um, we, I guess we again talked about splitting on and creds RS. I know that this has been brought up on, on a number of calls before, kind of splitting the trait into role specific stuff to again, provide small bits and pieces wherever they are needed. And type state pattern is, uh, uh, I guess, an ongoing discussion. Again, it's not, it's definitely not a bad thing, but, and I'm, I'm also surprised that I'm kind of second guessing this, but um, like, I, like I told you in, in chat, if, if by any means we realize at some point that, you know what, we took the wrong approach, let's switch, then I'd rather have it now, uh, like the sooner the better kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Yeah, uh, maybe talk about this a bit. So I've seen that this is basically just, um, I don't know, some vulnerabilities being pulled on Discord, I believe, uh, by some bots and the test harness for one. Yeah, I guess this was, uh, we should get, partially or entirely fixed from what i've seen like the, the failures brought up were like the ouroboros crate which was not a, actually used and you mentioned something about a cargo lock file being pushed that was not necessarily representing reality so maybe that's what it looked for um and uh, what uh, the critical vulner vulnerability is the in the failure crate which we actually do use that's used in uh, vdr tools so yeah. Uh, uh, it shouldn't be anymore, actually, at least not soon and soon enough. Yeah. Um, essentially part of the, the credential migration thing, because it, it, I, I had to kind of tweak the VDR tools to kind of accommodate everything. 
<laughs> and I also modified some of the error handling in there to kind of not depend on failure. Mm. Um, yeah, and to also kind of reuse the, the errors from Indy because from, from VDR tools because we kind of depend on them for the conversion, right? So um, at least the, the wallet errors, because that's what we're interested in. And when the migration is done, the plan is to kind of drop a lot of VDR tools content and pretty mm -hmm. much just, um, just kind of keep the wallet part, but drop mm -hmm. everything else. Um, so if not implicitly, if we don't get rid of this implicitly, then I can put in some work and getting rid of it, no problem. Uh, but I think it should, we should be able to get rid of it. Um, yeah, so so yeah. this is, this is uh, just, I, I'm not like entirely sure what this refers to myself, but um, Stephen Karen invited us to um, a conversation or discussion around um, of mediators uh, next week on Aries VC okay. uh, working group meeting. So mm -hmm. yeah, they invited us to the meeting where they should discuss uh, creation of a mobile bullet friendly scalable mediator, which kind mm -hmm. of relates to our internship uh, projects, I think, mm, fair perhaps why yeah, I'm yeah. it. Yeah, the one that Nyan um, yeah. is assigned to. Cool. Okay, um, well, we did pretty much exhaust the entire hour, so that's, uh, that's kind of cool, uh, even if it were just the two of us. Um, I don't know, any other thing you want to add, Mira? Uh, nothing from my side. Okay, cool. Well, then, uh, thank you for tuning in and entertaining me here in all the chats. Uh, very, very cool discussion. Thank you for anyone that might be tuning in later and that was it for the call see you next week thank you very much see you next week bye bye, bye.